able to do this again. But this is so lovely. And I am so thrilled for us all to be at this location. Um, if it's your first visit here, please take a tour. Um, we're in for such a treat of lunch. We've had delicious meals here and it is a beautiful, wonderful place. Um, run by Susie and Tom Finley, who are amazing humans um, and, you know, live locally. And Susie is the, uh, the, on the board at Temple Emanuel. She and I have known each other for a very long time because one of the first before the morning series was, <laughs> was held at one of her places. Come on in. Hi. And where? There's lots of places. How are you? Good to see you. We have... I should have everybody. Okay, so I want to um, just apologize to anybody who's online. I'm a little bit concerned that this isn't going to translate so great for a hybrid group. But if it doesn't work, I did send a link for all of you for a just Zoom. So you could see pretty much the same conversation. But I'm glad you're here today. Okay, everybody, it's 11.35, so why don't we start? Sherry, could you just come say a little bit about yourself and about Hilltop Reserve? And thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Jamie. So I'm Sherry Chance. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Hilltop. Um, we are, I don't know if any of you are new here, but we are an independent living, assisted living and memory care. Um, and we have, uh, we've been open since February. We have, um, are owned by Tom and Susie Finley. So we're a small local, uh, locally owned um, community. And I'd love to share the community with anybody that uh, would like a tour afterwards and show you around. Love to. Yes, absolutely. We'd love to show you around. So please let me know. I am also going to be passing around this because we typically have a sign in sheet. And I was not organized today. <laughs> so if you all could fill in this as you go and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so, so much, Sherry. And I am Jamie Sarche. I am the director of pre-planning at Feldman Mortuary. And this is my colleague and very good friend, Susan Johnson, um, who works with us at Feldman's and also is um, a monument specialist. So if that's something you need to talk about, Susan would be the person for Thank that too. Jamie. And I'm so grateful to her because she can be here today. You've seen me with the technology. That's why I don't have a PowerPoint. If there's a PowerPoint, I get very distracted and don't feel present. And I want to be present for this conversation. And I want to be talking to all of you, not to a screen. Um, so I am so happy to be with all of you today. And um, this is not a typical conversation many of us have. You know, we live in a society that tells us we shouldn't. We live in a world that says, don't talk about death. Don't think about death. That's so morbid. Just get on about the business of living. Um, if you think about death, you'll make it happen. I just am here to tell you, I think that's all wrong. <laughs> Aside from birth, death is the only experience every human being will have. And if we are lucky enough to love people, we're going to experience their deaths as well. And that's very painful. But the grief is really a reflection of the love. And so that's how I try to look at it is how lucky we are to be grieving for people because that means we love them. Um, but I just really think that to have a meaningful, rich life, we have to face the fact that it will someday end. And truly, how many of you get projects done if there's not a date that it's due, right? I mean, I just heard, yeah, yeah I'm not great at it, but I just heard um, about some people who are trying to live forever. And I just think, why would you even want that? Because if life just went on and on and on, how do we have deep meaning in it? I think the fact that it does end really does make it more important, more valuable. So I think acknowledging that 
can be really, really, really helpful. Um, today, we're going to talk about all kinds of options that are available for being able to live our values even after our death. And what I mean by that is there are things you need to know about methods of disposition. And that means disposing of the body. That's literally what it means. We have to take care of a body after a death. Um, and there's many options for how to do that. Some of them we're a little bit familiar with. We've certainly heard about them. We've certainly heard of burial. We've certainly heard of fire cremation, but we don't know a lot about what those choices mean because we don't talk about it. Funeral homes literally will tell you not to talk about it. Um, and so we don't really know. We have a lot of myths about these things. And then there are some new options that you might never have heard about before. And Colorado is actually really on the forefront of these options. So we're gonna talk about all of these things today. And as I've said, I do a really interactive presentation. So I don't wanna talk at you. I wanna make sure that by the end of this hour together, that you're gonna feel like all the things you wanted to know were answered. Make sense? So if anybody would like to share what brought them here today, I would appreciate that. Yes, please, Anne. Here's my husband. was retired now, but he was an attorney. And one of his clients was a funeral home. And he came home and said to me, the gas pipe for cremation is five inches around. Think about it, how much you gas that mm. is. Mm. I said, oh, that's not the way. That's not the way. Thank you. I didn't know that the, the pipe is five inches around. That's good. See, I always learn too. And that's part of why I don't like to talk at you. We all have a lot of wisdom. So thank you. That actually is such a good point. So fire cremation is one you know. People just call it cremation. Um, and Anna's absolutely right. It does take a lot of gas. So fire cremation, and I'm not going to get into too much detail. There are things on the internet that even I have not wanted to watch. It's a gross and brutal process. A lot of people push back on me and they say, well, you're dead. Okay. But our bodies are how we know each other. That's how we connect with each other. And I am of the belief that we should treat our bodies with kindness, care, dignity, and respect. So fire cremation is none of those things. The body gets placed in an open flame. In It's called a retort, but it's an oven. It has to be moved around. It has to be stoked so that all the tissue burns off in a couple hour period. It takes the um, carbon footprint because of that five inch gas pipe. It takes the carbon footprint of a cross country road trip. That's how much gas it uses. Mm. And what is left after all of the tissue burns off is bone. So when we hear the term ash, that's the funeral business telling you not to think about this. There's no such thing as ash. In this case, what it is, is the bone that is left after the burning is put through a processor called a cremulator. That's what you get back in an urn. That's the ash. It is crown bone. So it's fine that it is, but you should know that. And if you've ever looked at it, like if you've had a dog cremated or a loved one cremated, it's, it's very brittle, so you can see bone fragments. Um, it's filled with gas, so it can be pretty gray. And it's really problematic when people want to scatter it because they think it's good for the earth. Because it's, you know, they think it's bone meal. It's not good for the earth. It is filled with petroleum. And so if you put it, if you want to bury a tree, you know, grow a tree there and you put your loved one's cremated remains there, it is very likely that that tree will die. And that then is another death that you have to deal with. I have a very close friend, Erin. She was my best friend from college. 
and her mom died suddenly and they had her cremated and they planted a beautiful bush and they used her cremated remains and it rapidly just died. And um, it was really painful to them. So, um, so there just really are a lot of myths. Many people tell me they want cremation, fire cremation, because they don't want to use up space. And that, in my mind, is really an environmental concern. And it's just really problematic. The only thing that I think from an environmental <coughs> position is more problematic than fire cremation is traditional burial. So that's um, removing some of the blood, replacing it with embalming fluid, um, having a non-biodegradable casket, maybe a steel casket and a vault. And that's all going to have, you know, a lot of carbon footprint because of all the resources. And then you put that in the ground. And then the embalming fluid leaches out into the groundwater. So that's really, 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 really bad for the environment. But there are reasons to do all these things. So, you know, you got to balance these things out. If you come from a culture that says you have a big public viewing, this is a big send off for the loved one, um, you need to embalm because of an open casket in that way, we need to think about this. I actually just learned about green embalming, which is a way to preserve for just a short period of time. Um, chemical embalming will preserve for months maybe longer. Green embalming just preserves for some days, but it's with oils and stuff. So it can help um, preserve the body if you want to have the public send off in that way. If you come from a culture that it says it's important to embalm, we could figure out how to do that for you in a way that is environmentally sustainable, is not going to leach out into the groundwater. So these are all just things we need to think about ahead of time. So who had been considering traditional burial or fire cremation? You've been considering traditional Jewish burial though. Yes, one, two, two of us. Okay, okay. So, okay. So, that, so when I talk about traditional burial, that's not in a Jewish tradition. Jewish traditional burial is not that. That, that is um, a lot of Christian, um, faiths do that. Um, I'm sure many other faiths do embalming and stuff. Jews typically don't. So Jews typically would not embalm. They would have a biodegradable casket or it's not necessary to have a casket and be buried in a shroud. So there's no chemicals added to the body. Everything is biodegradable. It all goes back to the earth. That is a very green way to go. And anybody could have that green burial slash, you know, if you are a Jewish person, that would be Jewish burial. If you're not a Jewish person, that's green burial. That's how Muslims do it. Um, so there are cultures that that is really the choice. And that is a wonderful choice. In my mind, that's the gold standard. And I'll tell you from an environmental perspective, it is really good. Um, it takes care of the earth. The body in the plot, in the cemetery plot, goes back to the earth. It becomes compost in there. Everything is gone within four to six years. The casket is gone probably within a year or so, depending on what kind of wood. If it's a plain pine box, it's going to be gone in a year or so. And again, you don't even have to have a box if you don't want to. Um, and within four to six years, the bones are gone. So they become compost. They help the earth grow. They are good for the earth. And I consider it the gold standard because it does offer a lot of bereavement support for people. So there can be ritual associated with it. There can be a service um, to inter our loved one, to bury our loved one. And that can be really, really powerful. There is a Jewish obligation to do that from a religious piece. But there's just from a bereavement position, no matter what, just as a human person, um, taking our loved one from where they are to where they need to be helps us to start on our path 
from where we are to where we need to be. Is there a question the, here? Um, it was a statement that burial at a cemetery takes up land. Burial at a cemetery does take up land. And in my mind, that's actually a positive. And the reason that's a positive is because that's all that can be there. There can't be a strip mall. There can't be um, an apartment building. And so it leaves green space. How many of you go on walks at Fairmont? I mean, Fairmont is a beautiful place. It is an arboretum. So it's a park. And cemeteries, actually in Hebrew, cemetery is Beit Hayim, house of life. So if we could be more comfortable with death, we would spend time in cemeteries. And so it isn't wasted and it really does maintain green space. And in the United States, there is plenty, plenty, plenty of land. <clears throat> cemeteries are built on such an efficient grid that I have been told that if literally every person in the world died at the same time and had to be buried, it would take up no more space than the state of New York. So I think there's another question too. So it is very efficient and it maintains green space. So in my mind, that doesn't mean you have to agree, but in my mind, that's a positive. And you have a place to go if you need it. If you don't need it, don't ever go. But the thing that's problematic is if you, you need something and it doesn't exist, that's when it's problematic. If you don't need it and it's just off out there and you're off living your life and you're fine, fine. And you never know if you're going to need it. So many people say to me, well, I never go to the cemetery. Okay, but you're going to be the dead one. So Maybe your kids would like to visit. Maybe your grandchildren. Maybe your great-grandchildren who never met you. You know, I um, have a child who's 27. He is named for my um, grandfather. Um, his Hebrew name is named for my grandfather, and his middle name is for my grandfather. He never met my grandfather. My grandfather died about eight months before my husband and I got married. We were very grateful he knew we were getting married. He loved my husband so much. It was so sweet. Um, but I think it was Thanksgiving, like in 2019, and Alec, my son, and I were going to donate blood at Bonfie's. So, you know, at Lowry, we were driving by Fairmont. My grandfather and grandmother are in the Jewish section in Fairmont. <laughs> and I just said to Alec, you want to go see Papa Joe and Graham? He never met them. Oh, he did meet Graham, actually. She died when he was about four. But we went and he stood and he contemplated and it was meaningful for him. And if that didn't exist, we wouldn't have had that experience together. I took a picture of him looking at the, the headstone, sent it to my mother, which then it's her father. It was so meaningful mm. to her. It was, it means something. And I keep rocks in my car because Jewish people, they put it stone on a headstone to say you visit. And I do that sometimes, you know, I go to cemeteries and I like to go to cemeteries. I think they're beautiful contemplative places. It means something to me. And it's funny what I find when I go to Fairmont, it doesn't matter wh what part of the cemetery I'm in, no matter what part of the cemetery I'm in, and this doesn't make sense. I can always see my grandparents' headstone, always. It doesn't make sense. I should not be able to, but it's some beautiful spiritual connection that I have with my grandparents. And I feel closer to them now than I did when they were alive. So that's about me. But um, anyway, so I really believe that burial is, green burial is the best standard. The yes. question someone asked was, um, where can one be buried without a casket here in Denver? There are many places in Denver that you could be buried in without a casket. Any cemetery um, would allow a kind of green burial. So there's like a spectrum of green. So um, in, in some cemeteries are gonna require a vault that goes over the casket. It's like the lid of a butter dish and it's to hold up the ground. 
And from a green perspective, I kind of think that vault might be a good idea, quite honestly, because then they don't have to keep rolling back the grass and refilling the grave as mm. it goes back to the earth. So I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but that is something to think about. But there are many cemeteries that don't require a vault, that don't require a casket. You could go to the Lion Cemetery. You could go to the Evergreen Cemetery. You can go to Seven Stone Cemetery. Um, the, um, the Jewish cemeteries would allow it. I'm not sure about a manual, and they do require a vault at a manual, but I know Mount Nebo, Rose Hill, and Golden Hill would allow burial with no casket. The one thing that I get a little worried about with no casket, though, is just, again, from a bereavement perspective. Um, if you've been to a Jewish burial and heard the dirt hit the casket, you feel it. You know, you feel it in your kishkas, really, and that's the goal is so it helps move the grief in your body. Um, and I just worry a little bit, like what does that feel like if your mom's in the, in the ground and there is nothing protecting them? Um, one reason I worry about it a little, we had a, um, a burial and this person was buried in a plain pine box and there was a big dirt clod and the clod hit the casket and it broke the lid. Yes. So your response is exactly why I think maybe having a casket is good, but I do think you can prepare your loved ones. You could talk about it. I have friends who literally got into the, um, into the grave. Their mother was handed to them. You know, they felt it, it's not for me, but they felt it was really healing. So, you know, but if we talk about all of this, we can figure out what feels right. Does that make sense? Okay. So any other, any questions about fire cremation or green burial, traditional burial, any of those things? Yes. So are there, are there many cemeteries um, in Colorado that are green burial only? Uh, so Repeat. green burial, okay. Are there many cemeteries in Colorado that are green burial only? Perfect. Colorado, but Colorado Burial Preserve in Florence, um, which is south of Colorado Springs, will not allow an embalmed body. Um, they will not allow a metal casket, but they will allow fire cremains to be there. Um, so, and that's the greenest of the green. So that one has no grass. They only have natural flora. And I guess the other word is fauna there. Told you I'm not a scientist. Um, so, um, and, and they are really working to bring the land up. Um, it was a ranch before. And so the land is really, really depleted. And so they're really working to bring the land back to a better state. And everything that they're doing there actually um, takes carbon out of the atmosphere. So it is a positive for the environment. Um, other questions? Yes. Remains have to be transported several thousand miles. Mm -hmm. What is the most efficient way to do that? If remains have to be transported, the most efficient way to do that is by plane. And thinking about the carbon footprint of that. In what form? Well, I don't know. In a, are you talking about a body? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. In so what form? So um, that body transport. Well, it depends on what you want. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. what you mean by efficient. So what are you looking for efficiently? Do you transport the body in a casket or do you use fire and transport what's left? Yes and yes. Yes, yes and yes. yes. So it's up to you. We transport full bodies all the time. If you've been on planes, you've seen them. Um, if you the the casket is the last thing to get on the plane and the first thing to come off. It's in a it's in a crate. You've seen it. You just didn't know you'd seen it. Mm -hmm. And my thought from an environmental perspective is that plane's going whether the casket's on it or not. So if you do a fire cremation, that carbon footprint and 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 all of the emissions that are going out into the atmosphere are very contributory to climate change in addition to the fact that it's not a gentle way to care for bodies. So I would never recommend fire cremation. The only time that I think it's a great idea is when cost is the deciding factor because fire cremation is the cheapest option. 
So that would be the only time I would suggest that. Yes, Greg. So we have a friend that did, she was like submerged in a tent. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to move on to another option unless there are other questions. There is an environmentally friendly way to get to ground bone, what we'll think of as ash, okay? There is an environmentally friendly way to do that. And, and Greg just alluded to it. So what happens in that case, it's called alkaline hydrolysis. That's the um, scientific name. Um, people are calling it aquamation. They're calling it water cremation. I don't know what mation means. <laughs> um, and I don't love that, that, that it's associated because it is not the same at all as fire cremation. So this option though, what happens is the body gets placed in a vessel with warm water, about 165 degrees. Um, it is gently heated. There's no flame. Um, and it uh, has an alkali that is similar to liquid soap. The vessel rocks a little bit. And in a couple of hours, the tissue has been rapidly decomposed. And what's left, just like in a fire cremation scenario, what's left is the bone. If someone has implants, if they have mercury in their teeth, if they have silicone implants, those things are just gonna be left in the vessel. So they're not going up into the atmosphere. They're just left in the vessel to be recycled. And then the bones are put through the processor, the cremulator, to be processed ground up to what we call ash. Now there's a huge difference between fire cremated remains and alkaline hydrolysis cremated remains. The huge difference is the fire ones are filled with fossil fuel. The water ones are just filled with the natural nutrients. So they actually are what people have always thought fire cremains are. So they will feed plants. If you build, uh, I mean, you probably have to be a little careful that you don't overfeed the plant but you are, they are good for plants. And the water, the 30 gallons of water gets taken to a flower farm. So it's reused. And if your family wants some of it for their, um, for their Tagawa gardens, they could have all of it, but most people would just get a <coughs> dropper bottle full because it has to be diluted a lot. It is a very, in, it's intensely hot with all the new, so it has to be majorly diluted. Do you have a question, Sherry? No, it's just, okay. Um, any questions about that? Have you heard of it before? Yeah. It's actually what um, Desmond Tutu did, which I think was maybe a year ago. So people, it got a lot of press. So I would say, if, if you would like to have somebody sent thousands of miles away, and you're comfortable with that, that's gonna be cheaper than sending a full body. And if you send a full body, you need two funeral homes. So you need the right. funeral, here, funeral home here to get them on the plane and get everything done here. And you need the funeral home at the other end to do whatever they need to do there. So if you're comfortable with that, that's a great option. Can that's a great option, yeah. I just wanted to share something. Um, my original plan, um, <laughs> My original plan was, and I did my pre-planning, I think it was my 47th birthday gift to myself and my family. I did it with Jamie. And so my original plan is burial, picked out my casket, um, hadn't gotten to the um, cemetery part yet. Um, but I was talking with my daughter who's 26 and seven years ago, um, seven and a half years ago, we lost our son to suicide and he was cremated, fire cremation. And we have his remains kind of everywhere. Part of him is buried in Grand Lake Cemetery. Um, my daughter carries him with her every day, as do I. I believe there are no rules in grieving and, and no judgment and you do things how you do things. So my daughter had mentioned to me, you know, mom, I'd really rather carry you with me. And I thought that would be kind of neat. I mean, you can still bury 
the cre- you know, the cremains. And so I have switched and I want to, I'm going to do alkaline hydrolysis. That's the way I'm going to go. So I think it's really important for people, like you said, to go, go somewhere and be somewhere. See, she can still come visit me at Claremont. Yeah. Whilst carrying me around. Yeah. And that is a nice way to do it. Because some people do want that. Phyllis, go ahead. Um, I have been watching, and this is several years ago, Jenny River. Uh-huh. And she had her um, years of recovery. Uh-huh. And she would take the grandson all of California with her pumpkin bathroom. And then wherever restaurants you like, she would put it. So, you know, that's really what Susan was alluding to is that when you can have them, you think about it. Yeah, it's fun. When you have this creative remains, you can do that. And you can't do that if you bury somebody. So, that is something really to think about. Some people tell me they want to be in the shoe department at Nordstrom and then they're going to put them in the men's suit. Okay. Yeah, but then they're going to be in the vacuum cleaner. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, other questions about alkaline hydrolysis? Yes. What What is the cost, how similar to Let fire me tell you. and burial? So with us, Feldman Mortuary, it's going to be fire is going to, the disposition itself, not including any kind of memorial service, so we're, these are just the starting things, is going to be $3,000. Water cremation is going to be $44.95, so not a hugely significant difference. Um, and when you do this ahead of time, you lock in today's cost. The funds get held by an insurance product. And if you want to, you can pay over time. In fact, I'm working on a plan right now for my um, the person who does my nails. And, you know, she didn't have a lot of money. And she needs to take care of her mother's plan. And her mom is going to be buried. Um, and um, so I'm doing a 10-year payment plan for her. And if her mom dies any time during the payment period, she's not responsible for the balance. There's a life insurance component there. Yeah, so when you're a young person, especially, it, I did mine at 42. Did you pay over time? You did, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, we both, I, I did mine over five years when I was That's 42. Great. My husband's, we had two kids in college, so we're doing it over 10. Likely I could pay it off, but it's this little monthly payment. Mm -hmm. It's not a big deal. And so I haven't paid it off. Um, so it really can be really beneficial. Um, and so the cost, we work on that. We say, what works for you? And then we figure out how to pay for it. You can do it in a single payment if that works for you. You can do it over a year for no additional cost. But then if you die during that year, your family is responsible for the balance. Mm -hmm. But we can do it longer than that and you're insured. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, Greg. So I live in Colorado and I retire to Florida. Okay. And I die in Florida. But I've got my three plate in that was a question. I wish I would always remember to bring that issue up. It goes with you. It's held by an insurance product. Feldman's only gets paid if Feldman's gets the service done. If a Florida funeral home does it, the Florida funeral home submits the death certificate and they get paid. Now, the one thing though, Florida is not going to say, um, oh, Feldman's 2022 prices were this, we'll match those prices. It's really going to be, here's the bucket of money. But, you know, it's a considerable bucket yeah. of money. Oh my God, are they bringing out grilled cheese and soup? Look at this. Oh, what a perfect lunch for today. I'm not going to show you guys that. <laughs> and who doesn't feel comforted by grilled cheese and soup? Yes, yes. Okay. So Colorado legalized in September of last year. So I think we might be on the anniversary. I think it was like the 20th, 21st, 22nd, when the first body was composted in Colorado. Now, people get confused. Green burial that I talked about at the beginning is compost, but that's in a cemetery plot. Now we're going to talk about composting in a vessel that never gets put in the ground, okay? 
So in this case, the body gets put into a vessel. It kind of is like a chest freezer, like it's got good insulation. Um, it's a pretty big cascading box. And you can have a laying in ceremony if you want, which can feel sort of like a burial. Um, in fact, I just did a plan for somebody to do that two days ago. We put that plan together. So what happens is the body gets put into this vessel with four times the body weight of organic material. So if you weigh 100 pounds, there's 400 pounds of alfalfa and wood chips in there. You can put flowers in, you can put paper, you know, you can write letters if you want. Um, so, and then that all gets put into this vessel and it gets taken to a warehouse where it's attached to um, really good airflow. And every so often it's rotated. And this is a very low tech way of decomposing a body. It is literally like your backyard compost. Um, the one thing is because it's only, the body is only in there for four to six months, the bones don't have time to compost. So the bones are, once the tissue is composted, the bones are taken out and put through a processor. So all of these things, other than burial, your bones are gonna go through a processor and then they get put back in and compost. Hmm. Make sense? What do the bones look like? Just, I don't have a clue. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> we should find out. Yeah. I don't have a clue. I do think about that. I think it's a kind of, I don't know. I'm guessing they're sort of dry. I don't know. Um, we should ask. But um, what's really interesting, we have somebody in one of these vessels right now, and they send us updates mm. of what's happening. They tell us what the temperature is in there and what's happening. So it's kind of cool. Um, and then at the end, after the four to six months, there is a truck bed full of nutrient dense compost. Nothing human. There's no DNA. There is nothing human about it. It is compost. It is soil. So the vast majority of people would get a box or two back to do with what they might do with ashes. Tagawa might get all of it. Um, the legislation that allowed for natural organic reduction, that's the scientific name, um, says it cannot be used for um, food. There's no reason it can't be used for food from, it's just an ick factor that the legislatures thought it was icky. So, you know, if you get it and you want to use it in your backyard garden, you are welcome to but we can't take it to, you know, an orchard, a commercial orchard and give it to them. Um, a lot of what's been happening with it is that it is going down to the Colorado Burial Preserve to help with restoring the land there. Because she needs, Emily Miller is who owns the Colorado Burial Preserve and she needs compost and it is really helping. So it is sequestering carbon out of the, um, the environment. Yeah. So what are some questions about that or anything else? What is the cost? Oh. So that is going to start at 8,000. But again, it can be paid for over time. And if you want burial, that's going to start at about 7,500 and then you need a cemetery plot. Does anybody have questions about a mushroom suit? Has anybody heard about the mushroom suit? Oh, funny. Okay. Often people have heard about a mushroom suit where you get buried in this suit that is embedded with fungus. And I get asked that a lot and it's supposed to help in the, in the decomposition process that um, one of our friends, Seth Vidal, who also works in this um, industry and does a lot of natural, he's real committed to natural stuff like we are. He says that the mushroom suit is like the foam finger when you go to the Broncos. And it's fun and it's yes. exciting, but it doesn't affect the outcome of the game. <laughs> so I love That's that. That's a good analogy. Yeah, isn't that a perfect analogy? So um, what kind of questions do you have? Yes, Linda. So on the compost, do you know how much it would take for the bones to 
where the, the body's totally composted? So the bones never get left in it to okay. be totally composted. Okay. Seth, Seth actually has the place where we do our composting in our in Arvada. That, that, and, and he is hoping to figure out what kind of bacteria would eat the bone. So it didn't have to be taken out. But the problem is he doesn't want to introduce bacteria and then have unintended consequences from that. So he's being really careful. So as of now, the bones will never fully compost. They have to be removed to be, they, they will, they just have to be reduced to compost. And then they do go back in, um, but, but they have to be taken out. Um, somebody else had a question. Yes. Is it likely that the cost for this kind of composting will go down because it's smooth? No, these things don't go down. Um, <laughs> no. Funerals double in cost. Any kind of disposition, any kind of stuff doubles in cost every seven to 10 years. Every seven to 10 years. And I've been doing this long enough that I know that's true. And I saw um, an article from Time Magazine from the 70s showing that. And that is true. So that is a huge reason why planning ahead is so important. And quite honestly, if you want something other than traditional burial or fire cremation, planning ahead is so important. There are not many funeral homes who do this. None of the corporately owned funeral homes do alkaline hydrolysis. None of the corporately owned funeral homes do composting. We do everything. Um, and I don't think they will either. They actually wouldn't. They were actually fighting against the legislation because they're doing just fine. And it's working for them. And so many, even funeral directors, believe that you have to be involved. They believe that there are reasons that you have to be involved. The only reason you would ever have to be involved is if your family wanted you to. You do not have to be involved to go over state lines, right. even though funeral directors believe you do. In fact, the person who just was saying hello to us at the very beginning, I don't know if you saw her, she worked at Moran and McConaughey for years and years and years and then came over to help with us for a short while. And she said to us, well, yeah, you have to be involved unless you're Jewish. And we're like, no, <laughs> you never have to be involved. I always heard that. About state lines. Yeah. Not, not that's in general. A lot. About state lines. And then I read a lot of articles and they go, that, that's just a con. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that funeral homes, that funeral directors believe it. So I don't think they're trying to lie, but they are lying. Do you have a question? Yes. So if you choose composting. Yes. So when you die, where do you go? Where does your family send you? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so it would be the same as any other method of disposition. So Judy asked, what happens if you choose composting? For any of these methods, here's what happens. If you die at home, your loved one's called 911. The coroner comes to make sure you died a natural death. Usually they don't take your body unless there's some reason they need to take your body. Um, and that would be if they, if they thought it was foul play. Sometimes they do it in a suicide situation. There might be reasons. Usually they don't. Um, and then they give permission to the funeral home for your body to be picked up. So the funeral home comes to get you. They bring you into their care. At Feldman's, Again, we do every option. We treat everybody. You do not have to be Jewish to have the benefit of our service. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we would bring you into our care. Unlike most funeral homes, you're not sent to a central care center. You are kept in our care and you're not rolled into a refrigerator a la CSI. You're actually left on a, on a I don't want to kill you, Greg. I didn't make you choke. Um, so um, you're let, you're on a cot. You're always covered. There are candles on either end. And it's, again, just like what I said earlier, we think that the body is the vessel of the soul. It's how we know our loved ones. And we want to treat it with kindness, dignity, and respect. And even if somebody's going on to be fire cremated after that, 
we're still going to treat them with kindness, dignity, and respect. And we don't have the vessels at, um, at Feldman's for alkaline hydrolysis. So we would take you to the alkaline hydrolysis place. What about so contrast it? With the compost, what we could do is like a laying in ceremony. And I would equate that to a burial. So we would have this vessel. It's beautiful, actually. They made like a ceremonial vessel. They call it a chrysalis, which mm -hmm. I love. Mm -hmm. So it's made out of fetal kill pine. And it's got the interior with the, um, the insulated stuff. And then the outside is, is ceremonial, so they would ultimately take the inside out. But um, they would have that at Feldman's. We would have some of the organic matter. So we would have your body in that vessel, and then people could shovel the organic matter into the vessel, which would be a similar um, tactile experience like shoveling at a grave. And so I think it actually is a very beautiful equivalent. The one thing I'm a little bit concerned about is the time frame. So I don't know enough people who have gone through this yet, you know, of their loved ones to chat with them. Like, is the laying in, do you view that sort of like, okay, it's over, we're, mm. you feel complete in this piece? Or are you waiting? Are you constantly mm. thinking about what's happening in that box? And you might be thinking what's happening in that grave too, who knows? Um, so that's what I kind of want to understand is how are people responding to it? The one thing that I do think about it, though, is like the if you wanted to have a laying out ceremony, you could, and it would be almost similar to an unveiling. And Ben Martin, remember, who spoke about rituals a couple weeks ago, he talks about how um, we were discussing this with the time frame and my concerns about it. And he said, you know, grief changes over time. So being able to circle back to it maybe that's a good thing. And maybe it is. So I just will always want to talk about it and think it through. We're never going to know exactly how we're going to feel or how our loved ones are going to feel. But what I always want to do is provide for them as much as possible and provide them a path to walk on. Because otherwise what happens is that people just get stuck with we got a dead body. We got to get rid of the dead body. And they get on what I call the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance, unless they come to Feldman's, is going to be fire cremation. Because it's the cheapest option. People think it's convenient. It's quick. They're, they're in a lot of pain. They want to get out of pain. They think if we just cremate this body, we're going to feel better. And truly, that isn't what happens. If they don't have any ritual, they don't process the grief. So that's problematic too. Um, but that is what happens. So if you want to give your loved ones the most healthy and healing bereavement they can have, providing these plans so that they know they did it correctly is really helpful. One of the things people get very caught up in we never talked about this. I don't know what to do. Dad didn't tell me. And then they're never sure they did it the right way. And the other thing that they get stuck with is if you just write it down somewhere and you get, or you give it to them, they don't know where it is. People don't go to the safe deposit box on the day somebody dies. They go to a funeral home. And if they go to the safe deposit box three weeks later and they realize, oh crap, we were supposed to do and we did, they are not going to do well. Thoughts, questions? But isn't that part, or shouldn't that be part of someone's durable power? Well, that's my like point. Things. So you can have a disposition of last remains. Your estate planner will um, provide you a disposition of last remains. I've been at Feldman Mortuary for 13 years. I have never seen one. Never. It's not an effective tool. It is not an effective tool. So, um, you know, I mean, I, I think that the people who wrote that legislation, I actually gave this talk at this estate planning council and a guy who wrote the legislation for the um, disposition of last remains was like, 
really? You've never seen one? He was really upset um, because he really thought it would, it would fix things. It would make it so people could still speak after their death. But if you don't have a plan at a funeral home, the funeral home doesn't know it exists. And I have never seen one. Larry, I don't know if you know Larry Mowry, who was our general manager for like 30 years and retired in 2020. He never saw one either. So it is not an effective tool. The effective tool is make a plan with a funeral home, pay for it, tell your family where to call. Yes. that's the plan that is the way to get what you want and to give them a path to walk on how many of you have had to make funeral plans or some other plans when somebody you love died yeah what was that like for you made pre-plans you had made pre-plans problem is you can plan all your life life changes okay then you have to rechange your plans. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And and that is something to think about that the plans are changeable. So until you've done, until the plan has been put into action, the plan is changeable. So even if you put all that you paid for, let's say a burial, you're going to do green burial and you paid for that. And then you decide, no, I really want fire cremation. You can the only thing is if you paid for it and the funds are in the insurance policy, no money can come out of the insurance policy without a significant um, um, fee. What What's the word I'm looking for? Penalty. Thank you. Penalty, a significant penalty. I just had this happen where um, in 2016, some people wanted to plan to be buried at Fairmont Cemetery or in the Jewish section in Emmanuel. Then they moved to Phoenix. They don't have children. They just decided, why are we doing that? And so now they're going to be cremated in Phoenix. I think they are going to do fire cremation. Um, Arizona doesn't have any of these other options. Um, and I tried to talk them out of doing this, but they canceled their um, their insurance and they lost about $6,000. And if they hadn't canceled it, it would have all been paid out at the time of their death. But I think their thinking is, well, we don't have any kids anyway. We'd just rather have the money. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can we pre-plan with you, but not buy insurance? Um, funds cannot ever be held at a funeral home without um, uh, putting it into an escrow account. Can we pre-plan with you and not pay? It's not effective. Um, if you want to put a plan in place, it, it just it, we have so many files of people who do what you're suggesting, where you just come meet with me and you put a plan in place. The family doesn't ever tell us we have the plan. And so that file doesn't get used and people um, people just start over. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that at all. I have a question. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I, my question is, is the ritual of Tahara available with all these options? Okay, so that's a great question, Leslie. So Leslie asked, in Jewish burial, there is a ritual washing called tahara. In Denver, we only have a Shomer Shabbos Hever Kedisha. That's who does the ritual. They will not do it if someone is not being buried. The only time they would do that ritual is if someone is being buried. So if you want that, you have to be buried. There is a progressive Hever Kedisha in Boulder. They're not coming to Denver to do ritual washings. I'm sorry. Um, Beth Evergreen was creating its own Hever Kedisha, but I don't know what happened with that. It's quite honestly a real big endeavor. It is being on call 24 hours a day. Um, it is a big deal to be in the Hever Kedisha. And you know, we get people in the years I've been doing this work, people will come to me and say, oh, we should make a progressive one in Denver. Yes, that would be lovely. It is a very heavy lift. Mm -hmm. So no is what I'm going to say is no. So uh, my second question <laughs> is, um, um, wait a minute, what is the cost of the Jewish traditional burial, burial without a casket? So if we did a, Jew, a traditional Jewish burial with no casket, but did Tahara, because I'm understanding that's important to you, 
Um, I would say that's going to be around $5,000. And then depending on which cemetery you would choose, the least expensive Jewish cemetery is Golden Hill. And that's um, $4,600 for the plot, opening and closing, um, perpetual care. When you go to a cemetery, they might say to you, um, here, you just have to pay for the plot. And then they don't tell you that there are all these other charges. I like you to know. So the least is going to be 4,600. The most is going to be a manual cemetery. And that's a lot more. That's probably double that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Feels like it's working okay having yeah. you guys on the Zoom. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, yes, Laverne. So I bought this travel plan. Yes. Now, do I need to contact a um, a mortuary in Arizona. Uh -huh. Okay. So let's talk about this travel plan. Thank you. So a lot of people are snowbirds, right? A lot of people have, live part-time in Arizona, part-time here. Um, and they think, well, what happens when I have a plan? You mind my saying? Laverne has a plan with me. We did it years ago. And they spend part of the time in Arizona. And if um, Laverne should die at that place, she has this very inexpensive travel plan. I think it was four fifty um, to get her body back. So instead of having to pay thousands of dollars and having to figure out who's the who's the funeral home we should use there in Phoenix, that's easy. But let's say you were in China, or let's say you were in um, you know Mexico. We once did have somebody die in Mexico, and the the stories I've heard is that we had to pay some bribes to get him out. And we don't know who to talk to. So when we have this travel plan, it's great because we call them. They have contracts all over the world. And we don't have to worry about who do we call or who do we bribe. They call and bribe. Hopefully they don't have to bribe. But so it's really good. And it's just an extra peace of mind. But then like this couple I was just telling you about who canceled their, um, their burial plan, they also have a travel plan. They're not going to use it now because now if they die somewhere else, they would just get cremated in that other place. Mm. And their insurance or their, um, oh, they would just pay for it. Um, but so then he was kind of upset because he's probably never going to use that travel plan. And likely most people will not. Most of us stop traveling before we die. But the truth of the matter is it's really wonderful, wonderful extra protection. We had somebody a couple of years, I think it was two summers ago, who died in Mexico and had travel insurance, that kind of plan. And it just made things so simple. Yeah, and now like in your case, your family always calls Feldman's. They don't need to call anyone else. We navigate it always, no matter where. So you're the intermediary with the insurance company? Yeah, and I'm the insurance, I am the insurance agent. Okay. So people don't know this. I don't actually work for Feldman's. I don't get paid by Feldman's. I only work with Feldman's. And quite honestly, Jim Cohen, who's the fourth generation owner of the oldest family-owned funeral home in Colorado, treats me as if I am a partner in the business. And that is lovely. And I love Feldman's, but I get paid by the insurance company. So unless you find a, a plan, I that's how I get paid. Yes. What is the lowest cost? I have to work it out for you. It's based on your age. It's based on what you're doing. But that's, we get together and we talk about it and we figure out what can I afford? Yeah, because that is my goal. Or what am I willing to put out? Yeah, with my cash flow. Yeah. Um, my goal is that you would never, never, never want to cancel this. <clears throat> um, and like I have people who are at Cavode, you know, the HUD housing. Um, one client in particular who I worry about all the time. Um, I can't get her to let them do an automatic funds transfer from her yeah. checking account. And so like she forgets to pay it. Mm -hmm. And if it, God forbid, lapses she and she dies, she's not going to have what she needs. And she's not a young woman, you know, and doesn't have reserves. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about it. And I watch, you know, okay, is it past due? I better call her, you know. I do, I watch. So I, I care deeply that my clients get what they need and only 
what they need. Um, I'll tell a funny story about this, this uh, brother and sister who came to plan for their dad. And they were doing a burial and I took them into the casket room and we were looking at the caskets and they said, okay, we'll have the plain pine box. And I said, okay, that's fine. I just want you to know that there's nothing inside it. If there's no pillow, there's no lining. And the sister was like, so I said, okay, I'm guessing that's not a fit. You don't want that one. And then the brother was like, well, let's just get this one. And I said, well, if you just want the pillow in the interior, get this one. You know, don't spend $2,000 more, spend $600 more or whatever. And he was, and then I said, I'm quite the salesperson, aren't I? <laughs> so my goal is literally to get you only what you need and to talk about what it is. What are the values that you're trying to meet? What matters to you? What is the goal? And um, if you were to plan and your family would still have to come in, they'd have to sign contracts and they would have to front all the money. So it's just not, it's not, it doesn't do what we would hope it would do to just write something down, but you can write it down and put it in that important place, put it in that knock box. You know, does everybody remember we mm. saw that on our first week, the NOK box, the knock box, that would be a place that um, would be a good place for them to know what it is that you want. Okay, it's 12.30. I am happy to talk for as long as you want me to talk, but I also want you to eat lunch. I want you to feel comfortable leaving, whatever. Yes. Are you going to follow up with us? I will happily follow up with you. If you feel like you want to make an appointment with me today, I would be honored to do that too. Um, I, I'm just so honored that you all have come, that you've been, many of you have been coming weeks and weeks in a row, and that feels beautiful to me. And I am just so grateful to this incredible building and the incredible staff here um, for all they've done for us. Phyllis. Are you being person to tell me that? Oh, so look online. It's N O K B O X. Maria Frietta put it together. It is cool. The, oh, yes. the box, it's got yes. everything that your personal representative will need. And it has like a little bag for keys, like where you label what the key is. I could use that right now. <laughs> you know, Judy Brock. Yes. She um, also um, gives a, a free, um, getting your ducks in a row. Yeah, like there are lots of things like that, like books and stuff. Yeah, so there are lots of books where you write everything in the book. This is like just files that you can slide the stuff in. It just seems like less work to me. My mom, my mom did something for us that I call the kaput file. And it's a red file in her filing cabinet and she just can drop stuff in there. And it's just, that's the place we're supposed to go. Although she refuses to put the safe deposit box key in there. I don't know why that has to be in the kitchen, but that's fine. I know that. You know where it is. Yes. But like in the in the kaput file, it says which bank. I am a person who is busy and I have a terrible memory. And I'm gonna be under a lot of stress. So having it in one place is such a gift. Is your name on the safe deposit box? Yes, my name is on the safe deposit box. Thank you. I have signed those documents. I also just got put on two of her bank accounts. My brother is a financial advisor, though he does a lot. And when my mom decided that she wanted somebody on the bank accounts, and she's 80 years old, that's a good idea. Um, I said, I know how to write a check. I will be on the bank account. So my poor brother cannot have to do all of that. And I don't know. If, if things go as my mom would like, which is healthy, 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 dead i will never have to do that and i wish that for all of you jamie i just have to say i, I go to a lot of these mm -hmm. and this has probably been one of the best series I've ever yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and amanda was our first speaker thank you wow <laughs> that's beautiful thank you greg yes 
I'm happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to tell you about it. Um, I am available to you always. I am available to your friends. I am somebody who's really happy to have discussions with people. If Feldman Mortuary is not the right choice for you, that's fine. I want you to have what you should have. Mm -hmm. But I really, really believe in planning ahead. I have never once found a family who at the time of death didn't say, I am so grateful this is done. I am so grateful. It allows us to just breathe. If we step out of our emotions, because we have to, because we have to get the business done, sometimes we're not able to step back into our emotions and they just get stuck. And that is not a good way to live. So Please let me know how I can be helpful to you. I am so grateful for all of your contributions. For those of you who shared your wisdom, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be here. I'm making my grilled cheese. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. This recording will be available. Please got it. Yeah. The technology is not for me. Um, but this one, even if it didn't, I, I have others that are you know, they fit for this. Yeah, I've done this for the library. Um, I have a lot of work online. Um, I have a TED Talk. I have a document. So that was more of the Thank you.